Oh boy, I can't wait to go into this haunted phone booth. How many views am I going to get on this wacky video, guys? <sighs> Rest in peace, Robbie. I, I, I miss you, buddy. I had a grieving friend all the way down in Arkansas named Robbie. He lost his girlfriend Cindy about four years ago in a car accident to a drunk driver. Now, there had been rumors of a phone booth that was dumped in Washita Woods, in the 2010s as a prank by some high schoolers. Now, locals confirmed the existence of the phone booth, but the park rangers around that area would always say otherwise. There's no such thing as a phone booth in these woods, that's just a rumor. Although if you do happen to see one there, you probably shouldn't go near it. End quote. Years later, stories on 4chan began to circulate, on how there was this magical phone booth in, you guessed it, Washita Woods. It would allow the caller to talk to ghosts, and the phone booth allegedly would only appear after midnight. While some stories online said the phone booth would always be in the same spot, some stories said otherwise. While these stories sounded fake, there were always one or two details in them that made them a lot harder to write off. They either had a great knowledge of the forest an outsider wouldn't have, or showing pictures of physical documents that looked legitimate, or taking pictures from, you know, inside the woods, whatever. With how desperate my friend was to talk to his late girlfriend, you can probably imagine where his head was at. So we headed out into Washita Woods, he spent hours outside in those woods searching, and he came up empty-handed. He tried walking down most of the common trails and found nothing to show for it. It was to be expected. Park Ranger said there wasn't a phone booth, you, you know. I told him that he was wasting his time, and I even bet him on the fact that it didn't exist. So then the next night, he went back looking again. He went deeper into the woods this time and went around that southwest area from the center mentioned before to see if it was there. And I remember him talking about how at some point along one of the trails it sounded like he could hear children whispering, but he didn't have any luck that night either and went home empty-handed. On the third night, it was actually pretty welcoming. He heard the hoots of owls nearby and it was pretty visible because there was a full moon, yet he couldn't find what he was looking for still. I asked him if he was ready to give up yet and, you know, pay me, and he said that he just wanted to do one more trip, and I, you know, of course said double or nothing, uh, ever the present gambler. Uh, it was a new moon, so it was extremely dark outside, and after hours of searching, he was ready to give up and go home, but he heard a faint buzzing sound in the distance, and it was quiet, but it sounded like a child was giggling nearby, so he turned back around and started walking towards the buzzing noise. After some walking, he finally found a phone booth. It even had the light on. Despite the rumors... There was, in fact, a phone booth out in Washita Woods. He even took a picture on his phone to prove it. He looked around the phone booth and even stuck a small tracker on it. He decided to walk inside and see if the rumors were true. While it looked like a pretty standard phone booth, the number pad was instead replaced with letters. So he typed in the name of his deceased girlfriend, Cindy, Sidney J. Williams. It rung for a short while, but he couldn't believe the fact that she actually picked up. He heard her voice again for the first time in, you know, four years, and he asked if it was really her. She was surprised and ecstatic to hear from him. He broke down into tears for the first time in a while, and they caught up for a little bit. It was touching, but after about 15 minutes, it sounded like the line was cut, and the light in the phone booth turned off. The door felt heavier than it was when he entered. He told me about how tired he was feeling after that, and how it took extra... How it took a lot of extra effort for him to get the door open. I told him to bring protein bars and coffee-infused gum as a way to, you know, stay energized through the night. And while he took some after, you know, he was feeling so tired, he recalled how they didn't do as much as they did before. So that's interesting. Um, after he turned away from the phone booth and started walking into the other direction, when he turned back to see if it was still there, it wasn't. 
His heart sank seeing that, you know, freaked him out a little bit. But he was able to make it home just fine. He, he told me about how amazing it was to be on the, you know, be on the phone. He, he talked about it with me on the phone for hours. I asked him if he actually, you know, saw the telephone or if he was just going crazy at this point. <clears throat> to which he showed me a photo of it, and, you know, that's how I lost my $40, rest in peace. When saw me lose some. Anyways, he did mention that it was a little weird how, in all of his nights of searching, he didn't run into a single bear. I just told him that's because he was a little lucky. Looking back on it now, though, I don't know for sure if that was the case. I asked if he was finally happy, who could let it go now, and he said that he, you know, would, who was, and that he'd give her, you know, one last visit tomorrow, and I told him that it probably wasn't the best idea because there's no way something like that didn't steal a part of his soul or something, and, you know, he said it was possible, but, you know, he'd just go back once, you know, he'd stay strong and persevere after, just like how he always does. And, well, he did survive his second visit. By the tone of my voice, you can probably tell that the story doesn't really have a happy ending. While it was easier for him to find on the second night because of the tracker, he noticed that it didn't work, you know, in the morning. It didn't show where it was, which was pretty interesting. On that second walk back, he could hear more children giggling as he got closer to the phone booth, and he had another great conversation with her. He said that the, um, this call lasted a lot longer than the last one. By the time it ended, he said that he felt truly at peace and that he could finally let her go, you know, move on with it. He said that the phone booth door was a lot heavier to open that time as well, though. He didn't know if he was actually going to be able to open it. And while he didn't visit for a month or two, he got fired from his job and it hit him pretty hard. His boss said that he wasn't as fast or as, you know, responsive as he used to be, and that he wasn't really earning his pay anymore, so he got pretty drunk. After that stupor, though, he was lying at home, you know, unsure of what he should do now. He didn't really have the motivation to do anything except for, you know, one thing. He went back to the phone booth. This time, he didn't tell me that he was going in advance. He, he just went. And when he gave that summary of the third night on how he blacked out in the phone booth, you know, he couldn't get out that time, and how he woke up in the woods, I could tell that he wasn't really, you know, himself anymore. He wasn't really Robbie. He sounded barely comprehensible on the phone. So what I'm guessing what happened is, since I didn't get a report from him for the fourth night, I checked to, like... I checked the GPS on his phone, and it was in the middle of those... And it was in the middle of those Washita woods, I tell you that. I asked park rangers to go the, to, you know, to that spot, and they were able to find his gear, but, you know, Gobby wasn't anywhere to be seen. They asked me if he was playing with the phone booth, because they saw a photo of it on his phone. Um, he didn't... Ooh. I remember telling them what his passcode was, it was 4321. Um, a very simple passcode, but I, I guess it worked for him. I said, yeah, and they said, okay, we're going to have to take this one off of record, but I'm sorry for your loss, and then they just, you know, hung up on me. I'm not going to pretend like I was all that close to Abby. We didn't talk very often. Um, I always felt awkward kind of talking to him. But I still feel a little bit upset when I think about the way that things played out. I even visited that forest myself once or twice in the attempt to see if there was a phone booth in it, and, you know, I found nothing. I figured it'd be best to leave it that way and just leave that forest alone, because I didn't want to end up like how Gobby did. So yeah, that was a little story about the nature of grief and the horrific lengths it can drive people to. I don't know if it was exactly whatever, you know, thing, or phone booth thing, you know, fault. <sighs> but, yeah... Some people will throw their lives away and refuse to move on from the past. It's sad, but, you know, it happens. If you enjoyed today's video, I want to thank you all so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. There's a Discord server linked in the description if you want to talk with me and other people in the community. Peace.